Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Mark Rothenberg. I'm the president of our society, the International Society for Eosinophil, uh, Eosinophils. And um, it's a great pleasure today to be having a webinar entitled Neuroimmunology and Eosinophils. Just want to give you some brief information before we introduce um, the moderators today. The International Eosinophil Society is an organization of scientists and clinicians interested in the eosinophil, a cell now associated with many diseases. The society sponsors biennial meetings, as well as monthly webinars and other educational programmings for its now over 300 members. During these meetings, we review new information about the eosinophil and its role in health and disease. Those that are interested in becoming a part of our society or joining our mailing list, please um, note this email um, information or the web address. You can use the QR code to directly link to the website as well. Pleased to announce that the International Asian Society is now offering free membership for early um, career individuals. It's also available to um, individuals that are uh, financially pressed, and um, and and feel um, that they you know would benefit from membership. And please um, note this barcode as well, so that you can um, become a member. And there is a special uh, pathway there for students and healthcare personnel, postdocs, as well as fellows and early stage faculty to join for free. We've also started a new um, program, which is reviewing articles. This is now live. These are articles related to eosinophils. The articles have been selected and reviewed um, and deemed to be important for the community. If you have any articles that uh, you feel are noteworthy, articles that you've authored yourself or those that you've read, or especially ones that are up and coming, please let us know. You can currently check out the current reviews and using this QR code. Wanted to also give you the heads up on the next webinar. This is a webinar to memorialize and honor the late K. Frank Austin. Got a very strong program composed of the speakers indicated on this slide. This is being jointly sponsored by the European Eosin Mass Cell and Basophil Society since uh, Professor Austin was um, really an, an expert mentor and scientist and spanned many different dis disciplines related to these fields and these cells. Please uh, register. The webinar will be on January 31st, and uh, it'll be at the same time as this webinar. Next slide. Also pleased to announce that we have now established um, the venue and beginning to plan for the 13th Biennial Symposium of the International Eosinophil Society. It'll be in Montpellier, France, on July 7th to 11th in 2025. Please pencil that in and note this, and more information will be forthcoming and certainly can refer to our website as well. I'd like to thank our Corporate Advisory Council, the organizations and companies that have sponsored us, and we are greatly grateful to their partnership. Today, I'm very pleased to have two excellent moderators. One is an early stage career individual, Ubaldo de la Torre, who is uh, training under Professor Matthew Drake. And we'll soon introduce uh, Dr. Drake and, and he'll um, say some words. Dr. Drake is an, currently an associate professor of Medicine and the Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care at Oregon Health and Science University. He's a principal investigator on a number of um, research studies, particularly related to asthma. His research focuses on the role of the neuroimmune system and interactions in the pathogenesis of airway disease. He's also a primary mentor and core research faculty for trainees at the Oregon Health Science University and Pulmonary Critical Care Fellowship, and he serves in several scientific and, and educational roles nationally. We're very pleased to have him here today to be the moderator. 
Dr. Drake. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, and good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. We appreciate uh, everybody who's joining us uh, live for what's sure to be a really um, outstanding lineup of science today. Uh, before we uh, move into the talks, we have a few um, kind of ground rules and just information for the session. And to lead that off, I'm going to I'm going to throw it over to my co-moderator, Ubaldo de la Torre, uh, one of the fantastic graduate students in our program. He's um, uh, particularly interested in uh, in neuroimmune interactions in the setting of uh, maternal fetal uh, development. And uh, it has produced some outstanding science in that area. Uh, today, uh, Ubaldo is gonna lead off both the ground rules for our session, as well as introduce our first speaker, Ubaldo. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I'm excited to moderate with you and thank you for the opportunity. Um, so to just start with a couple of housekeeping rules, of course, uh, use the question and answer button to ask questions at any time during each presentation. Each speaker is going to have 20 minutes to talk, followed by a five minute Q&A where either me or Matt will be moderating the Q&A box to ask those questions. All attendees are muted and the chat feature is disabled and the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the IES website. If you do want to view the closed captioning or live transcription during the webinar, um, you can click the show captions button that is right on the bottom of your screen next to the share screen. We do have a very exciting speaker lineup today, and I am excited to see the difference in backgrounds between these speakers. We're starting with a PhD, followed by an MD, and then followed by an MD PhD. But loving the talks that are going to be talked about today, uh, just because it talks about my, my my favorite thing, which are neuroimmune interactions. Um, so we're going to be starting off with Dr. Hu Ping Shu um, talking about Neuromed and U programs eosinophils to promote mucosal immunity of the small intestine followed by Dr. Brian Kim talking about sensory neuronal regulation of tissue eosinophil inflammation. And we're going to end off with Dr. Caroline Sokol starting uh, with her talk on starting from scratch neuroimmune control of allergy. So to start us off, we are gonna be starting with Dr. Xu, who um, thank you for joining us all the way from China. I'm sure it's fairly late over there, but thank you for your time. Um, Dr. Xu does have an impressive background, um, starting of uh, getting his PhD in immunology from Tsinghua University, um, doing his postdoc at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, but from the time of getting his PhD just five years later in 2019, starting his research lab at Westlake University, which I think is fairly impressive and I hope to aspire to. Um, but with that, I'd like to take it away. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. Let me share my uh, slides. Uh, let me, can you see my slides now? Yep, we look good. Whoops. Okay, great. Again, thanks uh, for the introduction. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Mark and uh, the Society for the opportunity to present uh, in this uh, wonderful uh, seminar series, uh, webinar. Um, so for my talk today, and let me how to move my slides. So for my talk today, I want to start with a brief introduction about my lab at Westlake University. So um, I started my independent lab in 2019, right before the pandemic. And the research interesting of the lab is to study the regulation of tissue immune homeostasis and the inflammation in the barrier tissues, especially including the intestine and the meninges. So we are particularly interested in the crosstalk between immune cells and tissue microenvironment signalings, uh, such as uh, neuronal and metabolic signalings, um, and how this crosstalk are involved into the uh, immune homeostasis and inflammation. So for my talk today, I will merely present our recent studies regarding the neuron immune crosstalk networks in the intestine. So. As we know, intestine is a, large, is a major uh, organ for the nutrients absorption uh, from the diet. And this function uh, is carried out by this single monoclonal of the epithelium cells. So the area under the epithelium named the lamina propria, it contains roughly 70 to 80% of total immune cells in our body. So the intestine indeed is the largest uh, immune organ in our body. And these immune cells have to constantly react to the antigens uh, um, from the diet and the conventional microbiota to maintain this uh, uh, sort of immune homeostasis to maintain their function. And not surprising the dysregulation of such a large and a complex immune system uh, often leads to a different types of inflammatory diseases such as uh, IBD and the food allergy diseases. Now for this type of chronic immune diseases, I, I think currently 
we do not have a, a really curable treatment to terminate the inflammation. Uh, the hormonal the antibody therapies is only able to slow down the progress of these uh, diseases, but not able to complete restore the uh, um, immune homeostasis like in healthy uh, peoples. So for the intestine immune system, we actually know quite a lot about uh, different type of immune cells or immune cell states uh, due to the, the ones of recent sequencing technologies at a single cell level. And then we also have quite good knowledge about how these different type of immune cells communicate with each other through the secreting different types of cytokines or chemokines. However, the inflammatory responses in a tissue usually do not happen in a solution or in addition, like we do the in vitro experiment, but instead it's happened in the solid tissues. And recent studies suggest that tissue inflammation is tightly regulated by the microenvironment uh, signaling from the different type of tissue cells, such as epithelial cells, white adipose tissues, and stroma cells. So we, we believe the understanding of this uh, uh, sort of immune and tissue uh, cell crosstalk is potentially very important to developing uh, new treatment for those uh, tissue inflammation to restore the normal uh, immune homeostasis. So that one of the research direction in the last four years uh, in the lab is to really try to decode those tissue immune uh, crosstalk pathways in the intestine under both homeostatic and different type of inflammatory conditions uh, and try to understand how this crosstalk is involved in the uh, inflammation. And among all these different types of signaling made, uh, uh, delivered through different types of tissue cells, uh, we are particularly interested in the decoding the crosstalk between immune cells and nervous system, and particularly uh, neurons. So the reason is that these two systems uh, share so many uh, similarities uh, to my point of view. So both immune and nervous system are widely distributed in almost every organ in our body. So both of them contain enormously diversified cell types. And uh, there's no, basically no single cell type alone in each of the system is able to support the function of these two systems. Basically require different uh, cooperations between different cell types to support uh, their function. And both systems have to constantly sense different types of environment changes and stimulations. And based on the sensing, they have to uh, take a very specific reactions uh, based on the signal that they sensed. And finally, both systems have quite the ones memory encoding system. So based on this co uh, very common principle uh, between these two systems, it's probably not surprising that um, the neuronal signaling has been shown to regulate uh, activities of different type of immune cells in different tissues, like the spleen, skin, and the lung. So these tissues are highly innovate with fibers from the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system like a ganglias. However, in contrast to the lung and spleen and other major organs in our body, the intestine is unique in terms of their neuronal structure and the components. So in addition to uh, this extrinsic nerve fibers from the central nervous system, the intestine uh, contains a large number of neurons within their soma, uh, with their soma inside the tissue. So these neurons are termed as uh, intrinsic anterior neurons. So here is a representative picture. The intestine was cut longitudinally and spread on the slides for imaging. I hope you can appreciate that the high densities of these intrinsic neurons or ganglia in the intestine so this is also um, named as a second brain. Um, so the classic function of these anterior neurons is to re regulate gut motility. And however, the recent published studies have shown that these neurons in the ENS, uh, in the gut can regulate immune reactions and inflammations. Uh, for example, in 2019, our work together with study from the VG Culture and the General Share Group demonstrated that uh, group two in, in native lymphoid cells like ILC2 express receptors for uh, neuron peptide CGRP. And this CGRP mediated uh, signaling pathway actually can suppress ILC2 proliferation, thereby uh, uh, antagonize uh, allergic reactions in the gut. And in contrast, another group of neuron peptide named as NMU, um, and through the receptor NMUR1, which are expressed on ILC2s, and this signaling pathway has been shown to activate ILC2 responses and promote type 2 immunity uh, which has been nicely demonstrated by these uh, three beautiful papers. Now, these studies clearly demonstrate that the activity of these same type of immune cells, in this case, ILC2s, is tightly regulated by different type of neuronal signals. 
So based on this work, we become our lab become uh, interested in further understanding the crosstalk between the neurons and different types of immune cells in the intestine. So one strategy that we took to uncover potential crosstalk between neurons and the immune cells is to use a whole month tissue staining and imaging to analyze the interaction between different immune cells and the neuron fibers. So for example, here I'm showing the whole month staining imaging of TUBB3, which marks neuron fibers, and the secret F, which is a mark of eosinophils and tough cells. So um, when we saw this result, we, we become excited because we noticed that most of secret F positive cells were in close proximity to the lower fibers, with a few exceptions, uh, which did not contact with the fibers, which are actually EPCAM positive tufted cells. Now you may argue, okay, this is, does not mean anything because the density of the fiber and the immune cells are so high, and you probably get false positive signaling. So because of this, we further performed uh, transmission um, electro electron microscope image to look at the interactions between, for example, in this case, eosinophils and axon bundles. Now we are lucky because uh, eosinophils and axon bundles are so easy to identify in the tissues because of their special morphology. So here I'm just showing the four examples. We are very easy to identify those interactions. We are even able to observe these vesicles which appear to be transmit across cell types during this interaction. So to me, these close interaction patterns indicates a potential function crosstalk between uh, these neurons and the eosinophils in the uh, intestine. So when talking about eosinophils, probably everyone in this group of audience knows that traditionally, they are considered as terminal differentiate effector cells that release granules in response to parasites infection or allergens. And also the lifespan of the eosinophil in tissue in general is short compared to other myeloid cells like macrophages. Now this type of properties uh, lead people to believe that eosinophils maybe cannot cross or do not need to cross talk with the tissue cells in homeostasis in the absence of, uh, meaning in the absence of inflammation. But however, uh, previous studies have reported several unique features of eosinophils specifically in the small intestine. For example, it has been shown that eosinophils can survive half-life roughly two weeks, so which is sufficient for them to cross talk with tissue uh, environment. And also at a steady state, at least in mice, a small intestine contains a quite a large number of uh, eosinophils. Uh, the number is much more than ILC2s, uh, for example. Uh, and furthermore, um, the Mark group has done many pioneer and significant works to demonstrate the unique gene expression profiles of eosinophils in the small intestine, such as CD22 and many others, uh, relative to uh, the eosinophils in other tissues. And also intriguingly, it has been shown that eosinophils can undergo the degranulation in healthy human tissues, intestine, as I illustrated here. Um, and the function of this homeostatic, homeostatic degranulation is not very clear uh, from that paper. And finally, the recent works from the uh, Kassim um, Macro group show that a deficiency of eosinophils impairs the villus development. So all these unique properties indicates that eosinophils might uh, uh, have very special function in a small intestine in homeostasis. So uh, to better or comp uh, to comprehensive, more comprehensive, understand the specific uh, transcription states of eosinophils in the small intestine, and also to explore the expression of potential receptors for neuron transmitter or neuron peptides, my PhD student really uh, isolated eosinophils from different tissue of mice at a steady states and generally seeding library for the sequencing. And sorry, analyze the data and extract those genes specifically expressing each of the tissues and plot them on this heat map. So as you can see here, bone marrow, as well as the small intestine contains the most unique expressed genes. So genes specifically expressed in the bone marrow are merely cell cycle genes, so are reflecting their progenic states. Uh, in contrast, eosinophil in the small intestine expresses not, not a very interesting genes. So some of them are involved in the classroom biogenesis, uh, biosynthesis pathways, and with not of them actually uh, are in the g protein couple receptor pathways. Now to further rank those tissue, uh, small intestine uh, specific genes, we, we did uh, this ranking process. So due to a time, limit of time, I'm not going into the details of the, the, the ranking methods, but just saying the, the analysis highlights that the neuron NMU receptor, NMUR1, as one of the highest and the most unique expressions in small intestine eosinophils. 
And the specific expression of NMER1 in small intestine eosinophils was confirmed first using a quantitative PCR analysis. So before our work, uh, NMER1 was proposed to be ILC2 specific genes. So really to accurately track the endogenous NMER1 expression, we generated a knocking report on my slide as illustrated here, basically insert a GLP into the endogenous locus of this gene. And the analysis of the report mice revealed that NMUR1 is expressed in a subset of small intestinal eosinophils, but not eosinophils in any other organs we did analyzed. And this is different to ILC2s because ILC2 basically all of them express NMUR1 at different tissues. So um, we then leverage this report string to characterize those NMUR1 part of eosinophils. We confirm that those cells have typical ring shape or those bilob. Uh, nuclear morphology as you hear here, as well as uh, those eosinophilic cytoplasma as reflected by this pink or purple colors here. And uh, however, we also noticed that those part NMU1 particle cells uh, displays a lower eosin staining intensity compared with their negative uh, controls. I hope you can see a lot of white space here. So this somehow indicated that the granule states might be different between these two groups of cells. So we then go ahead to analyze the CD63 that has been reported to associate with degranulation of eosinophils, and we see this increased uh, CD63 expression those, in those NMUR1 positive eosinophils. So to further analyze the degranulation states of these cells, so we perform the EM imaging, and then analyze the granule uh, states in the positive versus negative cells. And you can see here uh, the total number of intracellular granules uh, of, in the NMUR positive eosinophils was a slightly but significantly reduced compared to those inactive cells. But more importantly, we further observed is a significant increase in the proportion of the empty granules, which are highlighted with the red color here, which actually is a sign of the degranulation based on the published literature. And also increase the proportion of those intact uh, granules in those positive um, eosinophils. So this data together demonstrates that those NMUR1 expression in small intestine in eosinophils is positively associated with the enhanced degranulation activity. So to directly determine the function of the NMUR1 uh, expression in degranulation, we quantify the granules in NMUR white type and the knockout eosinophils, small intestine eosinophils. As you can see here, the lack of NMUR1 expression in eosinophils significantly increase the total number of intracellular granules. And more importantly, the um, MUR deficiency uh, decreased um, the uh, increase the frequency of the intact granules and did reduce the frequency of the empty granules in the small intestine eosinophils, reflecting a compromised uh, degranulation. So therefore, we conclude that those MUR one media signaling may promote the eosinophil uh, degranulation in the small intestine. Now to further invest the function of this NMUR1 uh, in a cell intrinsic function of NMUR1 in eosinophils, initially we did not have NMUR EPX mice uh, in-house and we had a very hard time to import those mice uh, from US due to a pandemic. So we generated a mixed bomeric chimera as a, 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 a alternative model. Basically we, we transfer the NMUR knockout bomeric cells together with the bomeric cells from gut, uh, eosinophil deficient DBL gut one mice at a ratio of one to four. Now by doing so in this chimeric mice, all eosinophils were um, MUR1 deficiency, but the majority of other immune cell type were differentiated from this gut, uh, DBL gut one mice, so which are MUR1 intact. So this chimeric model allowed us to invest the cell intrinsic function of MUR1 in eosinophils. And also given that uh, eosinophils are so important for this uh, parasite infection, uh, anti-parasite immunity, and also we have data which I did not show you today, those uh, parasite infection can induce NMU1 expression in uh, small intestine. So we change these chimera mice as well as the control uh, chimeras with the parasites. And we found that uh, the lack of NMU1 expression in eosinophils significantly increase the worm and burden reflecting a compromised anti-parasite immunity. And consistent with the defect of worm expression, we, we, we see the garbage cell hyperplasia was significantly reduced in NMU1 deficient uh, mice. And we did not find uh, uh, other obvious difference in, for example, ILC2 activity or tapped cells. 
So it seems to be there's a specific defect of Gabi cell hyperplasia that suggests that maybe eosinophils are somehow crosstalk with a Gabi cell differentiation in these inflammatory models. So now when we look into the literature about eosinophils and Gabi cells, we found that in two, um, 2015, Mark Group has already reported the defect of Gabi cells numbers in eosinophil deficient mice at the steady states. So this uh, led us to think about maybe the NMUR1 expression eosinophils already contribute to the homeostatic uh, differentiation of Gabi cells in the small intestine. So we analyzed the Gabi cell numbers in the small intestine of these chimera mice and indeed find the defect of Gabi cell differentiation. And uh, we also have confirmed all these phenotype using the EPX queen mice at the end of this project, but I just uh, due to a time, I will not show you this data. So therefore, the NMUR1 has important cell intrinsic function in your synophils. At least one of the functions is to promote the Gabi cell differentiation. Now, on the other side, we also want to ask whether the perturbation of the ligand the NMU is sufficient to change the differentiation of Gabi cells. So to do so, we employ the chemogenetic strategy to either inhibit or, or active those NMU, uh, NMU expression neurons by NMU CRE and I found that the inhibition of those NMU expression activity reduce the number of Gabi cells in the small intestine. And conversely, the activation of these neurons significantly increase the Gabi cell numbers and more importantly, promote the mucus production as you can see here. So I think this data suggests that directly manipulated neuron, NMU neuron um, activity can change the development of Gabi cells. So uh, with not of data I did not show you here uh, to summarize what I have presented today, we found that in addition to these ILC2 cells, NMU is also expressed in a subset of eosinophils in both mice and human. Um, and these NMU on part of eosinophils have quite distinctive features, including a quite di different transcription states as well as the degranulation states. And we have data uh, suggest that the expression of NMU1 in small intestinal eosinophils is programmed by local microenvironment and it can be further induced by the inflammation, which I did not have time to present today. And we also found that NMUR1 maintains eosinophil numbers and promotes eosinophil degranulation in small intestine at the hemostatic conditions. And finally, we demonstrated that NMUR media eosinophils can promote Gabi cell differentiation. And the detailed mechanism for this crosstalk remains unknown at this moment, and we are working very hard to try to understand this crosstalk by both in vitro and in vivo strategies. So, and also I want to mention that the release of this uh, immune modeling neuron a peptide or neuron transmitter from antigen neurons is not a random process. So by investigating the heterogeneity, particularly the expression dynamic of immune signaling receptors, in those antigen neurons at the different inflammatory conditions, as I illustrated here, our ongoing work suggests that some of these uh, antigen neurons can directly sense the change in immune signaling and then specific modify the expression of this neuron uh, um, peptide as a feedback. So hopefully next time I will have another opportunity to introduce these exciting findings. So uh, with that, I want to thank everyone in the lab who worked on these projects and also thank all the collaborators and the fundings and thank you all and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Wonderful, Dr. Zhu. That was an uh, outstanding uh, illustration of some really exciting science. I, I did want to make a plug for your your science paper that just came out as well in the last couple months. Uh, for yeah. those online, definitely check that out for more details on this work. Uh, there's a few questions in the in the Q and A. Uh, first uh, was uh, it says I'm wondering why uh, Nermin U receptor one is specifically expressed in the small intestinal eosinophil population. What are the what are the environmental cues and intrinsic regulators for NMUR1 expression on eosinophils? Yeah, that's a uh, very uh, important and good questions. So, as I mentioned right now, uh, uh, we we know is that. Um, the expression dynamic for NMU uh, in eosinophils and the IOC2s are different. Uh, for example, uh, for P1 mice, basically uh, one day post the deliver, all the IOC2 in different tissue already express NMU1. But for the eosinophils, small intestine eosinophils, it takes about a week uh, for them to express in small intestine eosinophils based on the, our report on mice. Uh, so that leads us also with other data, we think there's some signaling in the intestine program the cells. 
two expressed in MUL1. Now the question is which singularly? So right now we have, do not have a very clear answer. We we try to change the diet of the mice and uh, we see some uh, changes by by different composition of diet. For example, by using a different vitamin uh, 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 control diet, we, we can increase or decrease the MUL1 expression. But that need more, like, the data is very preliminary. I think the nutrients maybe uh, play a very important function in terms of programming those cells and allow the cells to uh, induce an NMUR1 expression. Yeah, and I guess the kind of the the question that comes up with ch regulation of uh, the NMU receptor is what's also changing. What is changing in the NMU uh, peptide itself in terms of either expression or release? And is there something particularly unique about the small intestine uh, where yeah, that is a yeah. particular site of NMU expression? Uh, so NMU, based on my knowledge, it also expressed in, for example, in the colon. Um, they have uh, those child part of neurons can also express uh, NMU. We found that NMU itself can induce uh, NMU R1 expression level, but we do not think it's the it's a determining factor to program uh, to be to to induce those negative cells to become positive cells. Um, so um, and the NMU R1 expression uh, we know is induced during the inflammation, for example, uh, type two inflammation as shown by other groups as well. Uh, but at the steady state, how this uh, expression as well as a release of this uh, peptide is still need more work to to profile. Yeah. In in some of your work, looking at, uh, I mean, obviously you did these screens to look at a variety of different changes in in uh, unique features of these specific eosinophils. Was was were neuropeptides? Uh, was neuromedin U specific? Uh, specifically upregulated uh, in a way that was distinct from a variety of other sensory neuropeptides. Did you see changes in things like uh, neurokinin receptors and, and other neuropeptide uh, signaling? Yeah, um, the, the data we have now is to, at a transcription level, that's a more systemic to look at all these different type of uh, uh, neuron peptide. A, I'm not even talking about the release or the, at the protein level, but as a transcription level, um, in the, uh, we see some unique patterns. Uh, for example, in the type two inflammation, uh, NMU got induced, but in other type of inflammation, it's not induced. Uh, um, uh, so it's based on the um, context of, of the inflammation. But however, remember the CGRP and the NMU have quite uh, opposite function in terms of control of type two immune responses. But we 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 often see these two peptides were were co-regulate at the same direction. Um, but we, now we are looking at a, a time course. Maybe the the uh, the uh, those are different. For example, at the beginning, maybe NMU got more induced and promoted inflammatory response, uh, and then later CGRP come out to try to turn off the response. That's that's just hypothesis. Yeah. But it's 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 indeed very uh, uh, intriguing to think about why these two peptides. Um, by the way, these two peptides uh, particularly were released from the same group of uh, uh, sensory neurons in the gut uh, based on our sequencing data. So, yeah. it's, it's, so based on that, we, we think those group of neurons, as I mentioned in the last slide, it's a specific response to this type 2 inflammation uh, in this context. Yeah. Wonderful. We have a few more questions and just a couple minutes left. Uh, there's a, a comment that said, I really enjoyed reading. Uh, your fantastic study. In our work, it was quite clear that NMUR1 is an AHR-dependent gene in the small intestinal eosinophil, which means it can probably be influenced by dietary AHR ligands. Yeah, 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 yeah. So and those... Uh, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, so uh, there's a paper published from, I think, a, a Marco Corona group. Uh, it's a JM paper showing the, uh, the AHR get inducing uh, in the... Uh, small intestine eosinophils, and we, we actually map the expression of AHI, and we indeed found those NMUR and positive eosinophils uh, upregulate expression of AHR, and also upregulate genes like CD11C that has been reported to associate with the tissue adaption process of the eosinophils. Yeah. Uh, another question, in your opinion, do you think the NM, uh, NUMR1 positive eosinophils are tissue resident? Hey. I, I I'm I don't know I, I wouldn't call it tissue resident because to to my knowledge the resident take uh, meaning the cells really um can stay very long time 
but we we found the NMU part of the eosinophil is still a little bit longer, but they 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 actually quickly turn uh, replaced by the uh, progenitors from the bone marrow, and uh, so I will not call it resident cells, but it's indeed a, um, a unique group of eosinophils. And based on the transcription data, they, they don't regulate not of pro-inflammatory cytokines, for example, IL-4 and IL-13s. Instead, they upregulate not of cholesterol uh, biogenesis uh, genes. Uh, so we, we, we kind of have a feeling about these cells may um, have like a futures like a regulatory functions instead of pro-inflammatory, uh, at, at least at the hemostatic conditions. Yeah. Yeah, that that concept of of uh, a, a multitude of different eosinophil roles certainly has been a talking point uh, for the last ten to fifteen years in in, in our society. So um, okay. I think that's yeah. a great point to end on. We'll transition to our next speaker. But thank you, that was fantastic. Again, I'd thank encourage you. everyone to check out your recent publications. Just fantastic science. Thank you, Miss. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Brian Kim. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kim received his uh, MD from the University of Washington. Uh, he was an HHMI and NIH scholar, and he completed residency in dermatology at University of Pennsylvania, where he also uh, earned a Master of Translational Research. His lab focuses on mechanisms that underlie skin inflammation and the sensation of itch uh, as, a, as a, a fundamental and broad model paradigm for neuroimmunology. He's had a number of key discoveries, including the fact that first uh, he was the first to identify group two innate lymphoid cells in the skin of both mice and humans and has noted a variety of novel contributions of basophils, ILC2s, and NK cells to skin inflammation, uh, and particularly involving cytokine signaling and JAK signaling as well. Has over 120 peer-reviewed publications, multiple NIH grants. Uh, his work has led to pivotal trials, uh, clinical trials uh, that ultimately led to FDA approval for new treatments, uh, and is the inventor of an itch-centered itch technologies. His uh, research has uh, been funded by the NIH, Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, American Skin Association, American Academy of Dermatology, American Society of Clinical Investigation, uh, amongst others. Uh, and he also holds a patent for the use of JAK inhibitors uh, for chronic itch. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Kim, and it uh, looks like your slides are, are up and running, and uh, looking forward to your talk. Great, thank you. Um... So I, I think I actually do need to share my slides. Yeah, if you're able. No, I'll, I'll uh, switch over. Okay. Apologies. There we go. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Um, and that, that was a great talk from um, uh, Dr. Shu. So um, to hear, uh, eosinophils have been always a little bit tricky for us. Uh, but we've always been mindful of them because we've been studying ILC2s. And in many ways, eosinophils have represented a biomarker in many ways for ILC2 function within tissues. Uh, and, and as a dermatologist, I've also appreciated that there are so many conditions in which you get eosinophilia or you get eosinophilic infiltration of tissues, but it's, it's a little tricky to figure out exactly what they're doing. So uh, it's really great to uh, hear uh, about the functions in different tissues now. Uh, we've actually used atopic dermatitis as a, a, a model disease uh, in our laboratory. Uh, we sincerely care about this disease since I see patients with them uh, uh, with this condition, but also the complexity of the disease represents a unique way to generalize into other skin diseases, but also into other tissues as, as well. Uh, and for us, uh, doing a lot of neuroscience and neuroimmunology, understanding uh, itch, this is a fantastic disease in which to understand how inflammatory pathways actually uh, trigger itch sensation. Um, <clears throat> when we first entered the field, uh, it was long appreciated that uh, at the skin epithelial barrier, you have translocation of irritants or allergens, uh, other potential xenobiotics across the leaky skin barrier. And this is how you get activation of Th2 cells with the production of their the Th2 cell associated cytokines, IL-4, 5, and 13. And uh, as we all know, particularly at, at, at this uh, webinar, that these type 2 cytokines are critical, particularly IL-4 and 13 in promoting IgE class switching, which then dovetails back onto cells like mast cells, as well as basophils uh, harboring the high affinity IgE receptor. 
but also uh, we know that there are other cytokines at play, particularly upstream cytokines like IL-33 and TSLP that come from stressed epithelia and that uh, broadly promote this pathway. Um, the early work, uh, particularly from my postdoctoral work, actually came to appreciate that uh, I'll, particularly IL-33, but also TSLP has uh, unique properties on promoting innate cell responses like circulating basophils coming into tissue and being major sources of IL-4, as well as tissue resin ILC2s, which you heard a bit about as being major sources of IL-5 and 13 in, in the skin. And um, in atopic dermatitis, uh, as I've already alluded to, it is not uncommon to find uh, eosinophils, although eosinophils are not uh, in any way diagnostic or necessarily necessary, uh, and it's unclear exactly how they contribute um, in some ways to the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis, but they're, they do get involved because of the production of IL-5. And as we know, when you have ILC2s, you have IL-5. When you have IL-5, uh, you tend to have eosinophils uh, brought in. Um, sorry. But in um, recent years, we also came to appreciate that uh, these canonical type 2 cytokines can act in many ways like neurotransmitters uh, by directly binding uh, their receptor, particularly IL-4 receptor alpha, on sensory neurons and that uh, they employ downstream uh, Janus kinases to mediate uh, effects, particularly itch. So um, what exactly do these cytokines do? They actually promote itch. Uh, we know this, this is well established. If we flocks out this receptor, uh, that you, the, the nerve itself gets quite uh, anesthetized uh, to the uh, itch response. Um, I just want to highlight here, I thought I'd bring this slide in. Uh, this is all this work on the IL-4 receptor was done by Landon Etchen, um, who's now a, a neurology resident in the Harvard system. And uh, we er de detected early on just by just classic RT-PCR uh, expression of IL-4 receptor, apologies, uh, on from the DRG in both mice and humans, as well as the native IL-13 receptor, uh, alpha-1, as well as the IL-31 receptor. Um, as we know, uh, all of these cytokines are now either uh, approved targets in allergic diseases or imminent, for example, uh, the IL-31 receptor blocker. Um, what's interesting here from an eosinophil standpoint, given that IL-5 is such an important cytokine for eosinophil is that we actually never were able to detect IL-5 receptor in the um, in the dorsal root ganglia, where, which innervates the skin. Uh, Christian Tablo's group early on had identified, and this is relevant to the NMU discussion, had identified that IL-5 uh, production goes up in response to VIP production from lung innervating neurons. So which neurons? Uh, no-dose ganglia neurons. So there seems to be tissue-specific differences, that's not surprising, um, between cytokine receptor expression uh, within even ganglia, uh, between the dorsal root ganglia and the vagal ganglia, namely specifically the, the no-dose ganglia. Um, it's an interesting concept uh, that made me wonder whether even therapeutics, it may explain at the neuroimmune interface, how there the differences in terms of therapeutics and their uh, efficacy. Uh, for example, um, IL-5 uh, blockade probably does not have much of a role in atopic dermatitis, whereas it's a very important asthma. Uh, IL-13 receptor blockade or IL-13 blockade is proven to be quite important in atopic dermatitis, not as successful in asthma. So there's some tissue-specific differences in terms of expression of cytokine receptors within the nerves, but also the therapies themselves. Um, but we also know that these type two cytokines have to signal through Janus kinases. And if early on we identified that uh, expression of uh, JAK1 was particularly uh, well detected within proreceptive or itch receptive neurons. Uh, and a number of groups have now validated that a number of cytokines uh, actually bottleneck through JAK1. I, Steve Davidson's group recently has identified that other uh, that that in human dorsal root ganglia there is orthologous expression of a number of these receptors uh, that are that mediate itch, 
and uh, also identified, for example, that JAK1 expression is uh, highly enriched within itch nerves uh, within human dorsal ganglia. Therapeutically, this seems to translate quite nicely from the standpoint that JAK1 selective inhibitors or IL-4 receptor alpha blockers, like respectively, like abacitinib or dupilumab, are highly effective. Uh, the JAK1 selective inhibitor, abrocitinib as well, exquisite rapidity in terms of improvement of itch, particularly with the JAK inhibitors, probably because they signal a number of different cytokines, even at the nerve level. So you can calm the nerve down considerably more. Uh, we had a hand in development of the first JAK inhibitor, which was topical ruxolitinib, which now is reporting improvement out of itch within 15 minutes of topical application, something that you'd be very unlikely uh, ever to see with a topical steroid in atopic dermatitis. What we do believe is that cytokine blockade that are particularly relevant to the type 2 cytokine axis, uh, no question anti-inflammatory, but what we believe is that whether it's JAK inhibition or type 2 cytokine blockade, there is a tremendous amount of uh, selectivity towards itch effects that are at the neuronal level. So in many ways, we believe that just as much the weep and sweep phenomenon of type 2 response, and you'll hear uh, more about this in Kerry Sokol afterwards as well, is that th it's a behavioral extension in many ways of, of the, the type 2 uh, immune response is the scratching. Um, we also believe that the itch machinery has helped us to understand in many ways a number of different sensory phenomena that are quite overlooked in medicine, but also importantly, work from a number of groups, um, in, uh, in, including um, Kerry Sokol, Nico Gaudenzio, uh, Isaac Chu, um, the, a, a number of groups have actually in Artem Patapudian recently, uh, and I mentioned Christian Talbot that the, there's probably lots of things that we sense. And I and I, I feel that the kind of the rigor with what with which itch biology required to be recognized has helped in many ways to, uh, for us to understand how many different kinds of sensations uh, are potentially very important uh, even in beyond itch. And there's just uh, there's a rich amount of work uh, coming out from a number of groups, as I highlighted. Um, but the other thing to emphasize here is that um, there is um, more than uh, uh, the somatosensory nervous system, which mediates itch, we, we, that innervates the skin. What we forget is that the DRG also houses neurons that directly innervate internal organs or visceral organs and refer to these nerves as spinal visceral afferents. Uh, we also have vagal, the vagus nerve, which is actually largely sensory in function, although classically attributed to its autonomic functions, regulating breathing and heart rate is, is very much sensory. There are some, so the question at the end of the day is what can we learn from somatosensory biology to now extend into how we sense things within the body? As I mentioned, the vagus nerve is largely sens sensory. So if you look, for example, at the canonical cation channel trip V1, which marks nociceptors, at the single cell RNA sequencing level, you see that the vagus nerve is highly enriched for TRPV1. In our hands, if we take TRPV1 reporter mice um, and we look at both in the vagal ganglia as well as the DRG, they're essentially indistinguishable. You wouldn't be able to tell, apologies, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between these ganglia. Um, so this takes us to the current story, um, uh, that which is that when we first discovered that JAK1 expression in the nerves were critical within the DRG for itch, uh, uh, Stuart Turvey reached out to us and mentioned to us th the first patients that had been identified by his group to harbor germline JAK1 gain-of-function mutations. Not surprisingly, these patients are hyperinflammatory, have a pan-organ involvement of eosinophilic inflammation, uh, and what's interesting is, is that a, a little anecdote he told me that was not actually reported in the, in the paper was that these patients were very, very itchy, but their itch would not get better until they actually got a JAK inhibitor, ruxolitinib orally uh, through compassionate use. And it, so in, no matter of shutting down the inflammation was able to resolve their itch, it was with the JAK inhibitor. So we, we were hypothesizing that it was probably neuronal JAK inhibition that was able to drive this. If you see here, these patients have asthma, atopic dermatitis, food allergy, and environmental allergies. Not surprising. One of the things, though, that has emerged uh, subsequently with the discovery of other JAK1 gain of function patients by Dusan Boganovich here at Mount Sinai, that the most striking feature is the atopic dermatitis in terms of the atopic syndromes. Asthma is 
there, but it's not the most striking clinical feature. And I'll explain why that's important in a second. So we generated mice with the human JAK1 gain of function mutation. This is work from a very talented pediatric allergist, Masato Tamari. Um, and, and what we did was we inserted the human JAK1 in a manner to actually replace, uh, to disrupt the endogenous murine JAK1. And these mice rather spontaneously starting at, you can detect even at week four, uh, develop atopic dermatitis like disease clinically based on its skin thickness, have an inflammatory profile, notably eosinophils infiltration, consistent with, with what we expect in mouse models of atopic dermatitis. Uh, and, and you see histologically, there's more inflammation as well. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the interesting thing about these, these mice is that they, although they have germline JAK1 gain of function, unlike the humans, so like the humans, they develop atopic dermatitis-like disease. Unlike the humans, they don't spontaneously develop asthma. Okay, But here's the interesting hint. Look at the eosinophils here. So no differences in ILC2s, which is our favorite cell to look at in type 2 inflammation. Uh, no differences in CD4 T cells. But look at the eosinophils. Even in the germline JAK1 gain-of-function mutant, uh, we, thought, we thought they would have spontaneous asthma. They didn't. The, they actually have lower eosinophils. Okay, no pathology, but lower so, so what's going on there, right? Uh, and for us, eosinophils typically track really well with ILC2s. So what we did next was we challenged the mice. We said, okay, maybe because these mice are in uh, SPF conditions, they're not, they're not exposed to the things that humans are. Uh, so we gave them alternary alternata through the airway, robust ILC2 responses, not so great on the eosinophil here. Pathology, they do have aggravated pathology, but not the explosion of type 2 pathology that I expected. Why? Jack, they're already Jack 1 prime. In my in our thought, if you just give them a little bit of something, a protease allergen, shouldn't they just explode? They didn't. I mean, it was worse, but it wasn't anywhere near what we thought it was. So um, what we did here was we actually then uh, generated bone marrow chimera. Um, so we took wild type control mice, transplanted the bone marrow into irradiated wild type recipients. These are essentially control chimeric mice, but also transplanted wild type bone marrow into JAK1 gain of function mice. So the chimera here now, the stroma is activated in JAK1. Presumably, activation, these cytokines from the immune system have to activate something in the tissue to, to in, imprint pathology. So our thinking at this point was if we've activated JAK1 in the stroma, these mice should be worse off than these mice. It was actually the opposite. Uh, when you have these chimeras, they actually are protected in terms of ILC2 responses and eosinophils, and the pathology is commensurate with that as well. Um, so uh, we went back and said, what could be that stroma element? And we hypothesized, could it be the sensory nervous system? Um, and, um, and in fact, because of our work in the skin, we already had mice in which endogenous murine JAK1 was conditionally deleted from all sensory neurons. So not just DRG, but vagal and, and DRG. Uh, we can flox it out by way of the sodium channel 1.8 Cree, challenge them with alternary alternata and see what happens. And complement in complementary fashion to what I described, in contrast to the JAK1 gain of function, when we delete murine endogenous JAK1, we get aggravated inflammation in the airway. So this is all kind of the opposite of what we had expected. In this case, it was so dramatic that we get a robust ILC2 response and we get commensurate eosinophil response as well. So the question then was, is it the vagal afferents or is it the somatic afferents that innervate? We already kind of knew the answer. Uh, 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 Shin, Shin San at UCSD has already identified that when you label these nerves from the airway, it's really all uh, 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 vagal nerves that innervate the airway, especially the, the main uh, part of the lung, as well as it's primarily would be no dose ganglia rather than the jug jugular, which are kind of the most kind of uh, 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 rostral kind of extension in some ways of the somatic afferents. Um, and the way to test this is we use adeno-associated virus, which is a neurotropic virus, packaged with Cree recombinase as well as the human JAK1 gain-of-function variant. We infect the airway, and then we can do this in a T tomato stop flux mice. So then we can report out by way of the Cree recombinase which nerves we actually infected. Then we would have great confidence that JAK1 gain of function was in fact inserted into those nerves. When we do this, we reverse, we actually see a protective effect on the LC2s. Again, the eosinophils 
don't track great. Uh, uh, it's just, so it's it's a little blunted in terms of the response, but we see a, a reduction in ILC2 response, but we do see uh, improved pathology with this. Which nerves are they? As I already kind of uh, suggested, it was all vagal ganglia, not the DRG that are actually labeled with this infection. Um, finally, what we did was we actually uh, uh, took an additional kind of orthogonal approach. Um, we actually now, since we can conditionally delete endogenous JAK1, what we also did was we took another approach where we now conditionally inserted by way of the sodium channel 1.8 CRE, the human JAK1 gain of function variant. So this is just another way, but we did it in a way to knock out simultaneously endogenous uh, mirroring JAK1 as well, similarly as we did with the germline, and then subjected them to the alternaria, alternata model. And we see uh, improved pathology here as well when we insert the human JAK1 gain of function. Um, here we saw improvement of the ILC2 responses. Again, similarly, does, though we think there's a little trend, we didn't see much in the way of eosinophils. We screened a number of neuropeptides. And in this setting, what we found is that CGRP beta is actually uh, the neuropeptide that's elevated in this context. So in the interest of time, I won't go through all that data, but what we've identified is that in the setting of chronic lymphocytic inflammation, we get JAK1 activated by cytokines. This triggers itch. Itch causes, causes inflammation. You get more itch. But in the airway, what we've found is that, in fact, what we think at least is JAK1 activation um, triggers the release of CGRP beta. We, we've also found that it actually uh, regulates CGRP beta gene expression regulation as well. Um, so what we think is that JAK1 in the vagal sensory nervous system in the airway acts as a sensor when there's too much inflammation to actually shut off inflammation by way of CGRP beta. So we think that in addition to the existing atopic march hypothesis where epicutaneous sensitization early in life to allergens results in other allergenic diseases like asthma later in life, that there's another way in which there's some intrinsic built-in resistance to the development of asthma early in life. And we might be learning from these JAK1 gain of function patients where JAK1 has uh, evolutionarily conserved a distinct roles in terms of promoting edge, but shutting down inflammation in the airway in a neural intrinsic way. And this confers some intrinsic resistance to the development of asthma. Um, I'd like to just end by thanking all the people that did the work, particularly Masato Tamari and Landon Etchen, whose work I highlighted here today, our funding agencies, and our collaborators, particularly, I'd like to highlight Stuart Turvey, who if he had not reached out to me, we would not have had this project. Uh, thank you. That was a fantastic talk. And I don't know about anybody else, but I was actually finding myself itch my skin just a little bit as you were talking about it. Uh, we do currently have one question in the chat that I want to start with. It's from Imran Satya. And it goes, hi, Brian. I've always struggled to understand the neurophysiological relevance of IL-4 receptors or IL-5 on sensory neurons in somatic and parasympathetic neurons. Neurons typically express ion channels, which trigger depolarization and action potentials, but these IL-4 or 5 receptors are not ion channels, so activating them will not lead to direct depolarization. The question is, how do you think IL-4 activates neurons to cause itch, indirect via intracellular mechanisms, or do they cause greater membrane expression, et cetera? Yeah. No, thank you. It's a, it's a rich, rich question. A um, couple of comments there. Uh, I think that, uh, and and hi, Ron, how are you? Um, the the first thing is that I think these cytokine receptors don't all do exactly the same thing, um, but at minimum in the setting, if we just address IL-4 receptor alpha, um, it definitely induces uh, depolar, de, uh, memory depolarization. I don't think it induces an action potential. Um, in contrast, uh, I, I don't think it's proven, but I think IL-31 actually does induce an action potential much like histamine. Now, what do these things do across different neurons? I don't, I don't know. You know, you mentioned autonomic nerves. What's really fascinating to me is that if you have sensory dysfunction, you'll have autonomic dysfunction, in my opinion. If you have autonomic dysfunction, you're going to have sensory dysfunction. We, we see this with patients with dysautonomia. So it's not as simple as these are firewalled off. And it's simple. It's really easy to appreciate this in many ways. If you think about the big picture, if my heart rate is too high, you need a sensory arc for my heart rate to go back down. If my breathing rate is too low, you need a sensory arc for my breathing to go up. It has to detect those low oxygen. So there's a lot more that I think we have to understand just in terms of the difference between autonomic and sensory. 
the differences between si different cytokine receptors, even on say somatosensory neurons, but across different somatosensory neurons or different compartments, uh, as well as across say the vagal sensory and the autonomic. So th this is a very, very rich area. Um, and so I appreciate the question. I think there's so much to do. Awesome, thank you. And I do have one more question if we have time. And I'm more interested on the aspect of neurodevelopment. So essentially, some of the things I'm curious about where you mentioned in relation to atopic derm dermatitis, let's say you have atopic dermatitis at a very young age where you're still developing, especially your somatosensory cortex is still developing. How would you potentially, or have you thought about if you see differences in neurodevelopment in relation to those versus more sporadic or spontaneous atopic dermatitis later on? And no. do you see this with some of your Jack one mouse models as well when you knock them out from the get-go versus a conditional knockout, for example? Again, a, a big area, right? Um, the question, I think we, we just haven't, I'm an immunologist, so we just haven't thought of the sensory nervous system much classically, and we haven't thought of it as also a dynamic and plastic system. So I think it's a very good question. Short answer is I don't know, but I think a big area that we have to go into is, is there developmental imprinting? Or are we even, for instance, we know these patients develop eczema, for instance, really early in life, sometimes a couple months after being born. Um, does that redirect the nervous system in a way and re reorient the nervous system over time? And is that part of the pathology of disease that it's not just strictly inflammatory? Great, thank you. Uh, there is one more question in the chat um, from Daryl Adamco. Um, talk about really love the talk and helps explain why I do Pixin for atopic dermatitis. Uh, while the other biologicals do not, has anyone ever tried a jack inhibitor inhale to stop cough? No, not that I know of. Uh, I don't know that people have done that. But uh, what's the how much cough is shared with itch is is not clear. Um, a lot of the uh, pathways uh, that there's some overlap between itch and cough, but it's there's not as much overlap as as we had hoped, to be honest. But we don't know, it's still to be determined. The pathway that's most consistent is kappa agonism. So if you agonize kappa, it does shut down itch, it also shuts down cough. Um, from the cytokine level, uh, I think the reason why the field has been a little lagging is cough is very hard to evaluate, if not, so many say it's impossible uh, in mice. Uh, um, but the other question is sneezing, which you can evoke very, very easily in mice. Great, thank you. I uh, currently do not see any other questions in the chat. So with that, I think we are going to move on to our final speaker. Um, to close off this webinar, uh, we are going to be listening to Dr. Sokol uh, with her talk on starting from scratch, neuroimmune control of allergy. Dr. Sokol is a practicing allergist and principal investigator at Massachusetts General Hospital and an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. In addition to these roles, Dr. Sokol is also the Associate Program Director for the Physician Scientist Pathway in the Internal Medicine Res Residency at MGH. Um, she has provided several uh, seminal contributions to this field, but what I think we're really interested and excited to hear about is her work in her lab establishing sensory neurons as crucial in leaking allergen detection with dendritic cell activation and the initiation of the allergic immune response. So with that, I'm just going to pass it off to Dr. Sokol, and I'm looking forward to the talk. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so um, as you guys heard, um, my laboratory is really interested in how allergen um, immune responses get started up. Now, if we think about how immune responses get started in general in the skin, um, you know, we can go back to basics and we can split things in two. We can look at, you know, the type one immune response, the response against intracellular bacteria and viruses. And we know that um, it gets started up when dendritic cells are able to detect pathogen associated molecular patterns through their expression of um, pattern recognition receptors. That leads to very stereotypical DC maturation and migration, which we can actually see in the skin of the mice, okay? So we can look and see that um, these dendritic cells upregulate expression of activation markers shown here with PDL2. And we can see that specifically those Th1 skewing dendritic cells migrate into the draining lymph node shown here with CD103 as a marker. Now, when it comes to 
allergic immune responses, there are certain things that are shared. We know that allergens and, and toxins and allergens through their toxic activity um, can lead to dendritic cell maturation. And we can see that based on upregulation of the mark of activation markers like PDL2 on dendritic cells. And we can see the specific migration of Th2 skewing dendritic cells marked here by CD301B into the draining lymph node to start up the allergic immune response. But whereas the actual detection of those pathogens is quite well worked out actually for the type one immune response, it, there's a huge black box when it comes to the allergic immune response. We really don't know how allergens are recognized. We certainly know that the toxic activity or the functional activity of enzymatic allergens is necessary for all of this to get started, but who does the sensing? And this is particularly tricky because although dendritic cells will respond to allergens after in vivo immunization, shown here again with that same marker, PDL2, for, um, for a maturation marker, and they will migrate, as you can see here with the chemotactic index, okay? Although all of this will happen after in vivo exposure to allergens, if you take that same allergen and that same dendritic cell and you expose them and you mix the two of them together in vitro, the answer that you see or the output that you see is very fundamentally different. You see that these TH2 or these allergic skewing dendritic cells are really ignorant of the presence of that allergen. They don't upregulate maturation markers and they certainly don't increase chemotaxis as a functional um, marker of maturation. So, Knowing that there seemed to be something missing here, when I started my laboratory about five years ago, we were really interested in understanding what that allergen sensor could be. And when we were thinking through the criteria that that allergen sensor must have, we were thinking that it would have to be present throughout the body with specific concentration in epithelia. It would have to be capable of detecting a wide variety of toxic activity. After all, this immune response can detect things as widely variable as simple protein allergens and complex helminth parasites. And it would have to be able to act immediately in naive individuals. This is something, this is the innate pathway for recognition. We can't wait for IgE to already be there. Now, obviously, based on the session that I am in, you can see where we started, what we started thinking of, because all of these criteria we noted were um, criteria that could be achieved or sensing abilities that could be achieved by the sensory nervous system. So to see whether or not the sensory nervous system was even capable of detecting allergens, we had to see whether or not it would respond to allergens. And to do that, we took both in vivo and in vitro approaches. So starting off with in vivo, exposing mice to um, allergens such as papain here, which is a common allergen that we use in the lab, but also things like alternaria, alternata, also shown here, as well as um, dust mite allergens. We found that exposure to any of these allergens led to a robust itch response, as you can see here. And this is in naive mice. So this is a direct um, effect of that allergen. And what's important here is that we saw that the enzymatic activity was necessary to induce this itch response. So heat and activated papain had no ability to induce allergen, um, allergen mediated itch. But of course, this is in vivo, and we also know that we can get in vivo dendritic cell migration, right? So what about in vitro, okay? Although the itch response indicates that uh, neurons are being triggered somehow by allergen exposure, is that triggering direct? So to look at that, or to examine that, we looked at calcium flux um, on neurons grown in vitro. And what you can see really beautifully here are distinct calcium flux responses when neurons are exposed to papain, okay? Indicating that those neurons can do what dendritic cells cannot do. They can directly detect the activity of allergens. So it's all well and good, but the question is, is this sensing upstream of immune activation, which was our initial question. And so to get at that, we took two approaches to silence our neurons. We used both pharmacological inhibition with QX314, which is a lidocaine derivative, as well as genetic deletion of TRPV1 positive neurons, which we found to be enriched in their ability to sense allergens. 
And what we found is that if we looked at dendritic cell migration in response to allergen in mice that were depleted of sensory neurons, I think what you can see right here is that we lose this red or this migrated population, indicating that sensory neurons and the presence of these sensory neurons is required for allergen-induced dendritic cell migration. And importantly, we could recapitulate this with pharmacologic inhibition of sensory neurons using that lidocaine derivative. So just temporary silencing of sensory neurons also blocks dendritic cell migration, placing that um, sensory neuron activation upstream of dendritic cell activation and migration. So how are they talking? How are they communicating with each other? Well, as we've seen already in um, the great talks that came before me, you know, there are a lot of neuropeptides out there. We've already talked about CGRP, substance P, and NMU. In the skin, um, there are, of course, more neuropeptides, but we first started focusing on both CGRP and substance P, which are um, major neuropeptides within the skin. And what we found, interestingly, in both ex vivo skin explants as well as in vitro stimulation is that our allergens specifically induced the release of substance P and if anything inhibited the release of CGRP. Now, was that substance P necessary for dendritic cell migration? To look at that, we injected mice with substance P along with just a sham protein, OVA. And what we saw very clearly here is that substance P specifically induced the migration of Th2 or allergic skewing dendritic cells into the draining lymph node, phenocopying and you know, even doing a little bit better here than our allergen alone. Now, how are these cells communicating? How are they talking with each other? We looked at the presence of substance P receptors on our dendritic cells and our Th2 skewing dendritic cells and saw very specifically the expression of MRGPRA1 um, on our dendritic cells. And with the help of Xinjiang Dong's group, um, we're able to assess the migration of wild type versus MRGPRA1 deficient um, dendritic cells in response to allergens and found that MRGPRA1 is necessary for the migration of allergic skewing CD301B dendritic cells, but has absolutely no role in the migration of Th1 or Th17 skewing dendritic cells, which in the skin can be marked by CD103. Now, if you don't have dendritic cell migration, well, you don't get Th2 differentiation, okay? And we saw that trypv one DTR mice or mice depleted of trypv one sensory neurons lost their um, characteristic Th2 differentiation based on IL-4 and IL-13 expression after allergen exposure. So putting this story all together, we found this pathway whereby neurons directly detected the protease activity of allergens that led to itch. It led to the release of the neuropeptide substance P locally in the skin, which acted through its receptor, one of its receptors, MRGPRA1 on Th2 skewing dendritic cells to allow them to migrate into the draining lymph node where they were able to initiate allergic immune response. But is this all that's going on? For such a globally um, uh, shared sensation as itch, um, for such an important method of sensing, is this really the only immune response that we get from the itch? Now, of course, the answer is no. We've seen fantastic talks already that have shown that the immune response can be very varied and can be very, um, and can give us different outputs. But one thing that we were really interested in um, in our lab, looking at the initial response, was that inflammation that comes along with the itch, okay? And specifically, that inflammation that you see with initial allergen exposure or initial itch responses to allergens, which is so beautifully characterized in this picture by the inflammation around a bee or wasp sting, okay? And our question really was, what was going on here? What was the role of the neuroimmune response in this inflammation and why did we have it? Now, um, Nico Gaudenzio's group um, had previously published beautiful work showing that chronic 
allergic stimulation on the skin led to chronic inflammation, led to skin changes that looked like um, atopic dermatitis with thickening of the skin, um, with increased responses and increased immune cell infiltration into the skin, really showing that chronic activation. And, and what they, they showed here was that this was chronic interaction and activation of neurons um, that led to activation of mast cells, which led to this inflammatory um, cell recruitment. So obviously chronic activation of mast cells and sensory neurons can lead to this chronic inflammatory response, which here we know is going to be associated with atopic and allergic diseases. But why would we have this pathway just to cause a problem, okay? And we wondered if maybe we were missing the physiologic relevance of this pathway because we were looking at chronic exposure, chronic inflammation. And so we had the question really kind of focusing on this um, area of this initial exposure to an allergen of whether any neuroimmune inflammation to allergens could actually play a physiologic or helpful role. Now, why would this even be important? What potential role of this could, could there be for this inflammation? Well, we, we've already talked about the role of dendritic cell migration and playing an important role in initiating a type two immune response. But remember, all of this is in the context of exposure to a toxin or an allergen. Um, and one thing that I think the field is growing to recognize is that allergens and the allergic immune response may have evolved to really target the toxic activity of allergens. Now, why do we think that? A lot of this comes from a, a really beautiful piece by Margie Prophet back in the early 1990s, where she noted that toxins, if we are exposed to them, would have to be immediately dealt with, and that the allergic immune response was really a great um, way to immediately deal with toxic exposure. We know how quickly you respond to an allergen. She also noted that because toxins have effector function, anything with potential effector function could induce this response. Um, and we know now that allergens, that their effector function is what initiates the allergic immune response and that sensing that effector function initiates the allergic immune response. And importantly, she said that all of this could work and the immune response, the allergic immune response could work not only to destroy and neutralize the toxin, but also to set up aversive um, behavioral, uh, aversive behavior to avoid future exposure to those toxins. And we all know that chronic itch um, can be one of the worst, most um, uh, upsetting and concerning responses that you can possibly have. Um, and so all of this really kind of links the allergic immune response with the active with the antitoxin response. And so what we really wanted to know was whether or not this neuroimmune activation to allergens could play a role in detoxifying those allergens. And so just to look at whether or not this had any legs to it, we did the simple experiment of exposing mice on the skin um, with our allergen of choice, papane, which is again, a cysteine protease allergen, alone or in the context of a that lidocaine derivative QX314. And just looking to see what happened to the skin about a day after exposure. And what we saw here was pretty, pretty striking to us, okay? What we saw is that, of course, um, mice that got a sham injection had a slight um, uh, injury where, we, where they were injected with PBS. Mice that got papain um, had some inflammation where we injected it, which, was, um, which correlated with an increase in ear thickness. But what we were really struck by was that the ear of, ears of mice where the neurons were silenced became necrotic. They came, became necrotic, and they also, even despite that necrosis, really had decreased thickness, had decreased evidence of inflammation. And it wasn't just with this lidocaine derivative. If we also examine the ears of mice that were exposed to our allergen um, that were depleted of our trypv one positive neurons, and only those trypv one positive neurons, we saw the same thing. We saw necrosis of the ears just in response to the simple allergen, and we saw decreased ear thickness indicating potentially less of an inflammatory response. And this observation led us to think 
about the following hypothesis. Potentially exposure to allergens and exposure to um, toxic effects of these allergens leads to local inflammation, which is initiated by sensory neurons, okay? Of course, that local inflammation would lead to sen local um, sensations of itch, potentially allowing you to get rid of some of that allergen, but it would also potentially lead to activation of local innate immune cells, as well as influx of other innate immune cells that could break down and detoxify that allergen. So to start to examine this, we looked at the immune cells that migrated in response um, to allergen exposure. Now, first off, this is just showing you gating strategies. We looked at eosinophils, we looked at neutrophils, we looked at inflammatory monocytes. Um, and we looked at that in the context of sham injected mice versus allergen injected mice versus mice that got allergen and our lidocaine derivative. And again, as um, correlates with our um, inflammation from before, we see less cellular entry um, uh, into the skin of mice that were given the lidocaine derivative. But when we look at those cells, we see something very specific. And that is that, you know, neutrophils and monocytes, their, their entry is really largely unaffected by neuronal silencing. But really what we see is a specific break on eosinophil migration into the skin with sensory neuron um, silencing. Now that's not just in response to this lidocaine derivative, if we actually deplete the TRPV1 positive neurons, we see the exact same thing. We see a real block in eosinophil recruitment with real, really no effects on neutrophil or inflammatory monocyte recruitment. So that to us started linking the effect of these eosinophils and the migration of these eosinophils with the detoxification, okay? But what role are mast cells playing here? And so to look at that, we did the same assay, but now looking at um, mast cell deficient SASH mice, um, and this is data that we've repeated with other mast cell models, where we found that mast cell deficiency really played no role or had no effect on eosinophil migration. But of course, whether or not um, you had neurons um, active, active neurons are in green and um, the lidocaine treated neurons are in black, what you see is that that um, led to a prevention of eosinophil migration or a block in eosinophil migration. So to us, this started um, indicating that neuroimmune protection was really important against toxins. It was important in preventing um, unrestrained inflammation within the skin and that you needed this neuronal activation, which then somehow led to eosinophil recruitment and toxin neutralization, okay? Now, if this were the case, you would imagine that depleting eosinophils would phenocopy um, what you see in um, terms of neuronal silencing or neuronal depletion. So to get at that in a pretty elementary way for this crowd, we just utilize anti-CCR3 antibody approaches to deplete eosinophils from mice. And we saw, of course, that we um, were able to deplete them and we were able to block and we were able to deplete them both from the skin as well from uh, the circulating pool. And really importantly, when we looked at the ear skin and we looked at the inflammation, we see that eosinophil depletion, even by this crude method, really helps to phenocopy the necrosis um, that we see in the ears after allergen exposure, indicating together that neuronal activation from allergen, from these toxic allergens, is essential in actually protecting the skin from sustained toxic activity of these allergens, which would lead to tissue damage. So what if we actually game the system a little bit more, okay? What if we think about the biggest baddie of allergic inflammation, the most robust allergic inflammatory response that we can think of. What if we think of envenomation? What happens if we get rid of neurons, if we get rid of this protective system with envenomation, okay? And to do this, we looked at wild type or TRPV1 depleted mice, okay? And we gave them the equivalent of five bee stings worth of um, phospholipase A2, just one component of many that is in honeybee venom. 
And what was really interesting is that naive mice that were depleted of neurons and incapable of um, inducing neuroimmune inflammation um, in response to this um, allergen really showed a, a significant sensitivity to phospholipase um, A2 induced death, indicating that this pathway may actually be central in not only preventing local tissue necrosis and local tissue destruction from allergens, but also potentially could be an evolved mechanism protecting from allergen induced and venom induced tissue damage and death. I'd like to thank my um, fantastic lab who did all the work, our funders and all of our collaborators. And I thank you for your attention. Fabulous, thanks so much, Dr. Sokol. Uh, we have a couple questions, uh, one of which I, you uh, ultimately got to to some degree. Uh, Dr. Denberg, uh, prior to you discussing mast cells, had mentioned uh, that uh, mast cells interact with nerves in a variety of, of ways. And, um, you know, it, what might be the role of mast cells in this regard? Uh, you, you obviously spoke to their role in regulating eosinophil infiltration activation. Does I, I guess the question I would have there is, what do we know about the mechanism governing that eosinophil mast cell uh, unit, essentially, that interaction. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. And I actually have to say, we were actually quite surprised not to see an effect on um, eosinophil migration in our mast cell deficient um, animals. Um, now, whether or not we are looking too early, okay, and that mast cells may play an, a, a larger role later on, um, I think that uh, potentially we could see different roles if we kind of uh, zoomed out a little bit later in kinetics. Obviously, once you have IgE on board, mast cells are completely capable of doing um, uh, the job of 10 neurons, okay? Um, but I, I think that the difference between our role for mast cells and Nico Gaudenzio's like beautiful work showing mast cells have a clear um, interaction with sensory neurons may be in kind of the level of toxin exposure, actually. Um, and I do think that this it may have to do with this low dose activation, which somehow um, really promotes this mast cell neur sensory neuron interaction and allows the mast cells to, to amplify sensory neurons in a way that may not be necessary when you have a robust activation through a sting or another stimulus. Interesting. Uh, there's a couple of questions from uh, Dr. Rothenberg. Uh, first question was, is the eosinophil recruitment in these models, is it eotax independent? <laughs> um, so, so yes, um, it is CCR3 dependent, um, but we don't know which of the eotaxins are involved. Great. We had uh, another question. I know this has come up at, in some previous talks that I've heard you give. What about the non-protease allergens? How are they sensed and what do we know about uh, their mechanism here? Yeah. So I showed you one non-protease allergen. I showed you an enzymatic um, allergen, phospholipase A2, which cleaves the phospholipids. Um, so those actually also directly activate neurons. And one thing that we're really interested in the lab has been um, screening a lot of enzymatically active allergens um, to see whether or not they are detected by um, sensory neurons. But the big question is, what about all the non-enzymatically active allergens? Um, a lot of them also have toxic activity. A lot of them actually disrupt actin cytoskeleton. A lot of them actually um, can uh, intercalate into cell membranes or somehow disrupt the cell membrane. And that activity seems to be um, capable um, on its own of activating sensory neurons as well. So I think the biggest question remains, what about all these boring allergens that have no activity, the albumins, the globulins, um, how are they activating things? Um, and the what I would say is that early um, data in our lab would suggest that they're probably not activating sensory neurons, but they might be carrying small molecules that are capable of activating the um, neurons themselves. So there might be, this might give us a great way of detecting um, adjuvants, allergic adjuvants that um, hitch rides along with these um, lipid binding proteins. Great. And it, we've got time, I think, for one more question. Uh, fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Uh, do we know how eosinophils detoxify allergenic, allergenic proteases in contrast to other immune cells? Well, so it's a great question. Um, so, you know, eosinophils 
have so many toxic, I mean, they're packed with these toxic granules. They're beautiful cells that are packed with like such toxic granules. And so the question is, is there anything specific about their toxic granules? Is there something, um, is there another role that they could be playing? We also know that eosinophils netos or eotos um, um, and extrude DNA to kind of glom up the whole system, which could actually play a really important role here where we see that maintaining and kind of restricting the toxin to an area, almost walling it off, um, is important to allow some of these um, proteases to work that the eosinophils might have. But why eosinophils and not mast cell degranulation or neutrophil degranulation? Why aren't they capable of doing all of this? That's a great question. And we're trying to figure that out. Fantastic. So more work to be done. I couldn't agree with you more. Eosinophils are a beautiful cell. And I think we'll, we'll probably end on that on that note. I really appreciate the speakers today. This has been some fantastic science uh, and and just a, a really fruitful discussion. I know my my own mind was uh, you know racking up a variety of experiments to move forward with our airway disease. So uh, the cross collaboration uh, between eosinophils, other structural cells, particularly in the nerves, is uh, just an exciting place to be. Uh, a quick reminder uh, to uh, give the uh, QR code here a scan. Uh, this will take you uh, to the IES registration page. We encourage everyone on the call, if you're not a member of IES, uh, please join the society, contribute to this uh, exciting area of science. Uh, and you know whether you're an eosinophil, eosinophile or not, uh, we, uh, we welcome all in this, uh, in this society. And uh, it's, uh, it's just a, a wonderful place to exchange ideas like we've seen today. I'd like to thank both the speakers as well as my, uh, my co-moderator, uh, Ubaldo de la Torre, uh, as well as uh, uh, the board of the IES for, for putting all this together, and uh, particularly to our admin staff for IES as well, who uh, really uh, arranged all the technical elements of allowing this talk to happen. So uh, on that, I think we'll close. And uh, thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day.